probably do two separate recordings this morning um, in uh, reference to the fact that we have two uh, somewhat distinct uh, modules on, on what I wanted to cover. One, a kind of a, a bit of a, uh, I wouldn't say quite clean up from last time, but a bit of a, um, a, a uh, expansion on what we saw last time uh, with a, uh, an example that uh, illustrates some additional features of Galois connections that I, I didn't have the opportunity to emphasize during our last session. Uh, and secondly, um, <clears throat> uh, starting to delve into this uh, rather deep uh, and substantive issue of uh, a particular type of adjunction more generally. We talked about Galois connections representing adjunctions between uh, very special types of, of categories, uh, categories that are pre-orders or post-sets. Um, and uh, we are moving on to the topic of free forgetful uh, adjunctions, uh, adjunctions where one of the adjoints is uh, a forgetful adjunct, one that adjoint that forgets structure, and the other uh, is a uh, free adjoint, um, which is, has minimal restrictions uh, associated, it, it creates for a given object in one set, a corresponding object in the other set that is in some sense minimal restrictions. Now, um, in order to, to really explore that well, we need a set of intuitions. And those intuitions uh, are, are, are things that will cut across many different particular categorical uh, applications, but they can be fruitfully built up and refined by reference to uh, monoids um, as particularly simple examples. Uh, in category theory, we often try to try to grapple with concepts that have you know massively general applicability, but by uh, we we try to grapple with them initially by by sort of translating them into a variety of of uh, areas where we have firm footing, where we we understand very well uh, what's going on there, and we think about their applicability, for example, for uh, sets, or we think about and where morphisms are are functions between sets, or we think about them. Uh, in the context of pre-orders, where morphisms reflect uh, uh, some sort of ordering relation. Um, and uh, we may think of them in the context of uh, monoids and, and monoidal structure uh, in other cases. And uh, it's often very fruitful to kind of have this repertoire of basic examples uh, against which you can compare uh, a more, or on whose application to, application to which you can you could try to understand a more general concept. And um, so we'll be talking about uh, monoids uh, as well today, but in a broader sense than we did before. We kind of lo we're looping back around in a spiral sort of way, where we'll also be talking about, um, uh, for example, uh, some aspect of monoidal structure and a monoidal categories, categories equipped with monoidal structure, and indeed uh, the category of, of monoids, um, which is a, a neat concept that takes it to a meta level um, as is typical within category theory. So um, uh, today we'll, we'll be starting with this issue of, uh, uh, of uh, Galois connections. And the example on Galois connections uh, is one that I, I wanted to provide in place last time, but I, I didn't have time. So um, uh, I got something in place this time. Uh, I'm going to switch over to that and uh, see if we could cover it uh, in 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll switch back to, uh, and then we'll, we'll go on to this issue of, uh, of the focus now, which is, uh, free forgetful functors and, and particularly looking at, at monoids uh, 
as an example of that, that that will follow us through the next lecture or two. Um, okay, so uh, what I what I wanted to emphasize uh, in the context of uh, Galois connections uh, was something that I felt I hadn't really uh, brought out uh, well enough. Um, you recall that Galois connections, um, I should probably uh, probably uh, help uh, help review some of this for you, um, were, were adjunctions between pre-orders um, or, or between post sets. Um, and you'll recall that a, a particular pre-order was a structure which had some basic uh, order imposed on it. Um, and, uh, you know, in a classic sense, outside of category theory, we talk about uh, a set A and some order relation, uh, which we'll write without loss of generality is less than or equal to. And uh, here, um, uh, we'll have some additional properties which are of course reflected in the categorical um, uh, correspondence. So we'll have reflexivity. So A is less than or equal to A and transitivity. So if we have A less than or equal to B and B less than or equal to C, then we get A less than or equal to C. And each of those uh, you, you should be mapping in your mind to appropriate categorical um, um, uh, analogs. So uh, within uh, the, the um, the context of pre-orders represented in category theory, of course, uh, we'll represent each of the elements of the set A as objects. And uh, the morphisms uh, will be uh, from, so if we have two objects, A and B, uh, the if A is less than or equal to B, then there'll be a morphism from A to B. Um, and that morphism will encode the fact um, uh, whether or not A is less than or equal to B. If there is a morphism, it, it is. If, it, if there's no such morphism, um, then uh, we, don't, um, we don't have any such relation between A and B. And of course, uh, A is less than or equal to A is going to correspond to an identity morphism and transitivity is going to correspond to composition of those morphisms. And we noted, uh, viewed as a category, this is a, th a thin category or alternatively a, a Boole-based category. And I talked some about meets and joints, which I won't go into last time. But what I didn't, uh, I feel, do a, a good enough job of, of talking about, uh, while we went over a set of pre-orders and we went over some of these, um, th these monotone maps that correspond to adjoint functors uh, between these pre-orders or posets, um, monotone maps being one where if A is less than or equal to B in the source category, then F of A is less than or equal to F of B in the target category, where F is this uh, functor between them. Um, and of course, what that's saying is, is familiar from functors. If there's an arrow between A and B in the source category, they're there has to be uh, arrows between the images of A and the image of B in the other category as mapped through F. Um, uh, it's, it's a necessity um, for how uh, functors are defined that they preserve this, this structure. Um, they, they do something with that morphism that maps it uh, from A to B that maps it to a morphism from F of A to F of B. Um, now, uh, Within this context, um, I had dealt m predominantly with categories where we were um, uh, we were dealing on on both sides with kind of similar structures. For example, here, um, but we did see some uh, where we uh, where we broke out of that straitjacket, and this is a particularly interesting example of one that I wanted to show, where we have sort of a uh, a cruder category on the right and a finer grain category on the left. And so on the left, we have a, uh, a pre-order uh, associated with the real numbers from zero to four. And of course, um, I couldn't have prepared properly for this class if I had tried to draw all of them. I'd still be working on it and would be for the rest of my life and only just then starting. So I've, I've shown a a collection of uh, numbers of significance within that range. Oh, I'm sorry, that should say from one to four. I ended up 
bombing out on zero. Um, sorry. Uh, we um, can't see the slides. Oh, you can't. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's that's embarrassing. Um, so I will uh, share my screen here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, can you see them now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, here we have uh, a set of of numbers from uh, one to four that are reals, and we have a set of numbers over on the right that are reals as well. Uh, uh, sorry, that are, are integers as well. And uh, the right category, in some sense, is coarser than the left category. Uh, it it characterizes this same uh, this same uh, interval. Uh, I'll, I'll just correct that. It's it's one to four. I'll correct the slide later itself. Um, but uh, on the right, we have something cruder than on the left. Now, um, what I wanted to illustrate was a Galois connection between them. Uh, specifically, I wanted to indicate uh, a, a mapping between them, which, which observed the Galois properties, and in fact, uh, the adjunction properties that give rise to them, um, despite the fact that these are different levels of coarseness. Um, and this is a familiar uh, need within computer science and within modeling, where we're often dealing with a finer grain domain, think agent-based models in a coarser domain, maybe uh, compartmental model summaries of those agent-based models. And there's a correspondence between the two that's very structured. Um, it has well-defined uh, orderliness to it, um, but, uh, there's a lot of collapsing going on. And so it is here. There's a lot of collapsing going on, for example, going from these reals over to the integers. Now, what form that collapsing takes will be different depending on whether we're dealing with a left or a right adjunct, uh, adjoint. Okay, so what I'm showing you is um, this, this collapsing process or this process of, um, uh, of, of, of coarse graining in two ways, one um, with uh, right adjoints and one with left adjoints. And you'll see that there's uh, different requirements uh, associated with them um, that require different uh, functions to be used. So if we consider, you may recall the uh, Galois connections have a set of properties associated with them. Um, and one of the properties uh, comes directly out of the more general adjunction property. So with adjunctions, we have this Homset natural isomorphism. Uh, if we have category C on the left, category D on the right, then we could consider any two objects X and N, uh, where N is drawn from uh, this right right hand side from D and X from from C. And if we mapped, if we map, were to map N over through a left uh, adjunct, uh, adjoint to uh, this category C, we mapped it from D to C, uh, the set of homomorphisms from that L of N to any object, any other object X um, ha has got a be isomorphic to, uh, got to be on a one-to-one -one correspondence with, be bijective with uh, a, a a different hum set over in D. Um, and that hum set goes from that source N where we started to R of X, um, to that map over from X. And uh, this is for adjunctions more generally, we add that correspondence. And that may seem like a straitjacket, that it's essentially saying that they're mirror images of one another or isomorphic to one another uh, as categories. But that's not the case. This is a coarse graining exercise here. We have very different structure. It's just mirrors of each other's structure, one being much more abstract than the other. Um, and this adjunction property, Far from being a straitjacket that 
and then imposes exactly the same structure and exactly the same level of detail. Um, it corresponds to something that's that at some level is sensible um, correspondence uh, about how the integer domain um, preserves certain properties of the of the uh, real domain uh, while still uh, being much more abstract. So let's let's translate that adjunction property into into Galois connections. Well, here the hum set. A hum set over here in C uh, between two objects uh, is is going to correspond to to what 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 is a morphism in in this uh, pre order uh, on the left uh, Q a morphism corresponds to what a morphism between A and B corresponds to what thing between A and B we said it earlier it's it means that a is what? Less than or equal. Less than or equal to. Great. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, Wade, Wade got it on the nose. So it's less than or equal to B. Um, so what this, you know, C of L of N comma X really translates to is is some order relation uh, between those, right? Um, uh, so it means L of N is less than or equal to X. So, so if we have over here an N and we bring it over with L uh, and, and we can compare it with our, our X, right? Um, and it's saying L of N is less than or equal to X if and only if, N is less than or equal to R because these this is a C is a thin category D is a thin category either there is a morphism between L of N and X or there isn't and if there is then there has to be a morphism between N and R of X and D if there isn't a, a morphism there there's got to be no morphism over here uh, in D okay so what this is saying is L of N of X is L of n is less than or equal to x, uh, if and only if n is less than or equal to uh, to r of x. Um, that's that's something which which comes out of this. Um, and if you unpack that, knowing what L is and knowing what r is, you'll see it it comes out in 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 this relation uh, here. So n is less than or equal to x, if and only if n is less than or equal to the floor of of x. Okay. Um, and uh, if you stare at that for a while, you realize, uh, yes, that that uh, needs to be true if n is an integer uh, and x is an arbitrary real, uh, then then this uh, equation in, or this relation involving the floor of x uh, has also uh, got to be true uh, because n has got to be the next integer down uh, from 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 X for this to be true, and uh, if this is is not true, N is is got to be uh, greater than that floor of, of X. Um, okay, so uh, we also saw with Galois uh, connections that this same formula by by substituting in uh, cleverly, for example, uh, uh, choosing. R of X to be N and so on, we get this Galois round trip property. So I wanna walk through this with you. So, so let's go pick uh, a P. We're gonna test these properties here. Let's go pick a P, um, so some object P. Uh, let's pick three, okay? We're gonna pick three over here. So three is our P. We're gonna start at P and then we're going to take L that's our left adjoint. We, we know this big arrow points in the direction of left adjoint. We're gonna follow it over and it's gonna go over to three as a real, which I've written just to kind of communicate it's in the real domain is 3.0. It's no data types here. It's the same number, but it's we're viewing it in, in the real domain here. Okay, so that's L of P. And then if we come back, we'll get uh, via, via R, we have to be at a place that's greater than or equal to where we started um, 
oh my gosh, there should be arrows between one and two and three and four. I, I don't know what happened to those arrows. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so here, if we take that round trip, we have to be in a place that's at least as high up um, as, uh, as we started. And indeed we are, we're at three. So there's no problem here. And in fact, for all of these, if you go over and you come back directly, it's, it's going to be exactly the same place because it's surjective going to the right. This is a feature of what are called Galois insertions that we talked about last, last time. So this one is kind of trivially true in this case because it's a Galois insertion we always end up in exactly the same place. So in fact, we are gonna have P equals uh, R of L of P. There's no, no concerns there. The, the, the interesting one comes in over here where we have this coarse graining going on, okay? So let's take a look at it. Let's pick, pick a number, let's pick pi. There we go, we, we have pi. We're gonna have a slice of pi here. So here's um, a pi, this is our Q. We're picking a Q and Q, and we're going to go over uh, via R of Q into the integer domain. And then we're going to come back uh, via L, and we have to be at a position such that that round trip leaves us off less than or equal to our original starting point. So we went from pi to three over to three in the so three in the integer domain over to three in the real domain. And indeed we're by virtue of that round trip, we're less than or equal to where we started off. Okay, so we've preserved this relation. Now notice um, that that wasn't always guaranteed. So for example, if uh, three went over to four instead, we would have been in a pickle, right? Because if we had round trip, we, we would have uh, been up to four and the result of that round trip wouldn't have been less than or equal to pi. It would have been greater than pi. Um, uh, so, so that would have put us in a pickle. We had to have gone to three, um, uh, you know, if, if we had to pick between three and four, we have to, we have to go to three in order to preserve this property, right? Um, so here, uh, with malice of forethought, I, I use that right adjoint to be the floor of, of the, the real number in the source. So when mapping from the reals to the integers, uh, I did so with the floor function. And that gave us this nice desired property that uh, we have to, to which we have to adhere uh, here. And, you know, the real challenge to it comes in in these, in the coarse graining process. It comes in when we start off with a, with a, a, a number that's not directly represented over here in the integer category. We start off with this number like E over here in the real, um, the real category. Uh, and we map it over and we come back uh, we need to um, we need to guarantee this property. So it's automatically true for these ones that are in both categories, where again, we end up in exactly the same place. So here we have coarse graining going on, and we see that what emerges from it quite naturally is um, corresponds to something sensible. It's the floor function, right? Um, the right adjoint here, uh, is the floor function. It has to be the, the floor function, it turns out. Um, and we saw earlier, it couldn't be the ceiling function, right? Uh, if we had it be the ceiling function, we'd be, um, we would have violated this, uh, this property. The round trip would have left us off above our starting point. So, so this is an example of coarse graining uh, in the right adjoint, the one that goes in the opposite direction of this big arrow that points to the left uh, adjoint in the direction of the left adjoint. So it's by, uh, it's, it's through this, uh, through this uh, right adjoint 
that the coarse graining is happening, that we're collapsing things. And it's perfectly legitimate. We just have to do it in a way that's, that's true to the semantics of the situation. And what pops out is the floor function. Um, that, that is a well-behaved way of coarse graining from reals to integers that preserves this property. Now let's look at it as, let's look at coarse graining as the left adjoint. So here we have the same basic situation, but it's, you know, there's a little bit of a twist uh, so we can make it the left adjoint. So now we have the reals over here on the right. Um, before category P corresponded to the, um, uh, to the uh, integers, but now we're calling this thing on the right P. Uh, this thing on the left, Q, um, and uh, somehow my nice arrows are showing up here, which is good, um, as rightly they should. Uh, so over here, we have the, uh, the integers. Over here to the right, we have the reals. And once again, we're going to, of necessity, have some collapsing going on, some coarse grain, okay? And uh, here, it's going to be going on as the left adjoint. Uh, so the right adjoint, um, again, the, the left adjoint is shown in the direction of the, the big arrow. The right adjoint is going in the opposite direction. Um, so here, for example, from, uh, from four to four, four in the integer domain to four in the real domain, very straightforward, same thing, mapping from any integer to any real. It's, it's totally straightforward. It just maps to that number itself in the real domain. No problem there. So this um, uh, Q, uh, L of R of Q is less than or equal to Q is trivially satisfied. For every Q, um, every object over here in the Q domain, the integer domain, um, if, we, if we take the right and then the left uh, adjoints, we'll end up in exactly the same place. So this L of R of Q equals Q. Again, we have a surge action, it's a Galois insertion. But by contrast, it's, uh, it's in this next one that we have to worry about things. So let's take a P in, in, the, um, in this domain on the right. Let's pick, again, pi. We're gonna pick pi, okay? Um, here's pi. Uh, this is our P. Um, remember where we started. It's, it's this pi uh, object here. And we're going to take L, the left adjoint over here to, f and it's gonna put us up at four. You may think, oh, that's weird. Yeah, uh, it's different this time. Um, and it has to be the ceiling as we'll see. So if we take it over and we, we make it four, uh, and then we come back with the right adjoint here, which just maps four to four, a uh, four from integer to four to real, then we have to, uh, by virtue of that round trip, end up greater than or equal to where we started. We ended up in four, it's greater than or equal to where we started, which was pi. Uh, so we're in good shape, okay? Um, so it satisfies this property. Here, if we had used floor instead of ceiling, uh, three would have been mapped down, th oh, sorry, pi would have been mapped down to three and going back would have given us three and we would have violated this property here, this, uh, this first round trip property. P would, would not have been less than or equal to R of L of P. So um, here we had to have used the ceiling in order to achieve this, this property. And so when the coarse graining was a left adjoint, we had to use ceiling. When it was a right adjoint, we had to use floor. And those are two alternative, to use uh, Runar Bjarnason's uh, terminology, those are two alternative optimal solutions to the problem of translating between these two domains, these domains associated with reals and integers. Um, 
we could do so with a floor function uh, or we could do so with a ceiling function. Uh, and depending on whether we're dealing with the left or the right adjoint, um, we'll need one of those, a, a specific one. And, you know, I think this is indicative more broadly of uh, the, the common need to reason about categories, which in some sense uh, mirror each other, but it, with a son of twisty mirror, um, like you would see in amusement parks, um, which, which distort things or which collapse things. Um, and this is very common in modeling. We do have that collapsing going on. Um, we're dealing with a, a very fine grain model and we wanna course, have a coarse grained approximation of it, for example or dealing with very fine grained data and we wanna collapse it down. And we need ways of collapsing it down that are, um, that are in some sense consistent with the semantics of what's going on. In some sense, they play nicely with both domains and allow the coarse grained domain to mirror the effects of the coarse grained domain as best it can, to be consistent with it as best it can um, and to abide by comparable rules in its own sort of coarser way. And that's what uh, these, these adjoints can provide us. And we see these two different mirrored solutions for ways of achieving that. Um, I think there's, if you take this example and you imagine extending it outside the sphere of, uh, of, of uh, numbers, um, to other structures, uh, other data structures, for example. Maybe uh, you have age categories and you're collapsing age categories and health models, um, or you're collapsing um, uh, you know, a real number line into a set of, um, a set of intervals um, and, and keeping track of information on them, a discretization of a continuous space. Or maybe again, you're taking an, a, a uh, an agent-based model and, and characterizing it with a compartmental model, this coarse graining um, a need is, is ubiquitous. And uh, this provides uh, adjunctions. And here, Galois connections provide us a way of reasoning about it in a consistent fashion. So uh, are there any questions about this uh, example before I go on to the the, the second major topic for today, which concerns uh, concerns uh, the free for, working towards free forgetful adjunctions uh, through the lens of monoids. Any question about this? Okay, I'm not, not hearing any, um, so maybe I will go on. Um, uh, I'm hoping that that example um, will set the stage for the next um, bunch of topics related to adjunctions by getting you out of a mindset of thinking about adjunctions as somehow necessarily be, be between isomorphic categories, because they're not. And the two categories may have radically different structure as long as it's compatible structure, structure that in some sense plays by corresponding rules. Um, and that to me suggests a much broader sphere of application for adjunctions than if they had to be isomorphic. If they were just kind of isomorphic, if they were just corresponded with each other with different labels on it, it really wouldn't be nearly as interesting. But if we can have this coarse graining and, and yet preserve the, the fundamental similarities, the fundamental correspondence, consistency of these, now we're talking about something that has much greater up opportunities associated with it, much wider applicability. And we also have the opportunity 
to use the reasoning associated with adjunctions to tell us how we need to coarse grain. What are the acceptable ways of coarse graining, um, uh, which is very powerful um, to, to sort of tell us what, what do we need to do to play safely in translating between these, uh, these categories, be they database instances with different schemas, one coarser than the other, or about models or about numbers. We have that same basic coarse graining need that frequently comes up. Okay, so um, if there were no uh, comments on that, I'm going to, um, I'd like to stop this recording, but um, the, only, uh, the only thing I'm not sure about is,